Well, good morning. Merry Christmas aft. You know, we have Christmas Eve, and there's Christmas, and then there's Christmas aft, which is the day after Christmas. What will tomorrow be? It'll be a whole year until we get to Christmas again. Well, it's good to see you guys. Um, my usual last Sunday of the year is um, usually spent berating you about how fat and lazy you are and how you should get to the gym, lose weight, and go on a diet. Oh, no, I'm sorry. That's not me. That's YouTube. It's that time when you think about, you know, the New Year's coming and you're going to be making resolutions and breaking them. So I figured I'd just skip that and go right back to the Word of God. What do you think? Good, because it's much easier to follow that format than to create my own, I must admit. But I'm glad to see you guys here today. We're light today. There's a number of people that are uh, ill that either have... Uh, come down with COVID or been in contact with COVID people or been on the phone with someone with COVID. <laughs> so, and then there are other people just being considerate and feeling a little under the weather because they stayed up way too late and got up way too early. And I just don't want to come here and fall asleep and have me see that. So that's, that's where we are today. So th it's just us. So Rocco's kind of feeling a little on the casual side. I'm feeling a little casual, so. And of course, the day after Christmas is always the day when you, you show off the things that you were bought for Christmas. <laughs> this is my Christmas sweater from my lovely wife. Shout out to my lovely wife who is staying home. She would rather be home than be here. So she's fine. Good to see Howie with us today. Yay! Howie 2.0 has been remodeled. He's back with us. Glad to see you, brother. Thank you for bringing your wife with you. That's awfully kind. So we're going to be in the book of Luke again, and we're going to pick it up here in chapter 13. And Jesus is going to, uh, after he's spoken of many things, he's going to now talk about repentance which is a good old fashioned word, which means make a U-turn in your life, about bearing fruit, about being fruitful, and about being loosed. So all of these things, believe it or not, actually roll into the New Year theme, which I think will be good. Just a reminder as to where you are. Last couple of weeks, we've been going through the book of Luke. We saw Jesus talk about judgment, hypocrisy, and fearing God, because if you fear God, you won't fear anything else, right? Or if you don't fear God, you can fear everything else. And we talked about what it is to have coveting and worrying, these two things that Jesus addressed in the book of Luke, about how we tend to worry about things we can't change, uh, and we don't ever take that leap into activation to actually do something about the things that we worry about, therefore canceling out the worry and not making it worry. And we talked about covetousness, which is always wanting more, having enough, but always wanting more because we mistakenly believe that if we just had a little bit more, I'd feel better about myself, about the world, and about everything else. We talked last week about watchfulness. Jesus said that you should be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. And he says, he will come like a thief in the night. Of course, not to those of us who are expecting, but to those who do don't expect him, and those are the ones that will get caught um, by surprise. So this week, oh, I'm sorry, going back to last week, we talked about watchfulness. And Jesus said, you know, if you can look at the sky and tell what kind of weather it is and what you think is going to happen that day or, the, day, or the, the, the coming hours from then, then why can't you understand the, the times that you look at around you? And we can look around and see that things aren't getting any better, regardless of what all the evolutionists tell us and everything else. Things don't go from chaos to organized. They go from organized to chaos. We can see that in our own lives as they go. Jesus tells us that we should reconcile with God while we may. 
and he gives this wonderful parable of, you know, these two folks on their way to court, and as they're on their way to court, they should really have a conversation to work things out, because if you get to court and you stand before the judge, the judge might rule any way that he feels. And so it's best for you to kind of iron those things out before you get there. And of course, God being the ultimate judge as we stand before him, it's best to iron those things out before we stand before him. He talks about building a tower and who building a tower doesn't first figure out how much it's going to cost before he builds this tower. Well, that tower is uh, not us counting the cost of following Jesus because you can't really do that. How many of you knew what you were getting into when you accepted Christ as your Savior and Lord? No one. How many of you had any idea what you're getting into when you had children? <laughs> Same thing. Getting married, having children, accepting any job offer. You have no idea. And yet the Lord says, if you're going to build a tower, you're going to try to build a world based upon yourself, and you're going to try to be higher than God like the Tower of Babel, make sure that you have the resources to be able to handle it. And in the context of it, you don't have the resources to be good enough to stand before God on your own. We just don't. None of us does. And if you've got to go to war against somebody that's got way more soldiers than you, don't you want to have a delegation of peace or try to figure out how you're going to win that war? Well, the war between us and God is ongoing, isn't it? And the only way to win is to have somebody who will help us with a peace treaty, and Jesus Christ is our advocate to do that. So we talked about those things last week. Jesus says here in Luke chapter 13, verse 2 and 3, do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. It's a rather strong statement. Jesus is going to teach some very strong statements here. And I will just pay attention as we read through the text today. There were present at that, sesh, at that season some who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered and said to them, do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18 of whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse sinners than all other men who dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. For also, he spoke this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it, and he found none. And then he said to the keeper of the vineyard, look, for three years I've come seeking fruit in this fig tree and I find none. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? And he answered and said to him, sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and fertilize it. And if it bears fruit, well, but if not, after that, you can cut it down. And now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bent over and could no way raise herself up. But when Jesus saw her, he called, to her, uh, he called her to him and said to her, Woman, you are loosed from your infirmity. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. But the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation, because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. And he said to the crowd, there are six days on which men ought to work. Therefore, come and be healed on them and not on the Sabbath day. So the Lord then answered him and said, hypocrite, does not each of you on the Sabbath loose an ox or a donkey from the stall and lead it away to water it? So ought not this woman being a daughter of Abraham whom Satan is bound, think of it for 18 years. Be loosed from the bond on the Sabbath. And when he had said these things, all his adversaries were put to shame and all the multitude rejoiced for all the glorious things which were done by him. So it's interesting. We have this succession of these three things Jesus is doing. 
He's talking about repentance and about some tragedies that have occurred and some people that were discussing it. And what does that exactly mean? And, you know, we have these concepts of good and bad and, and, and why people, you know, why certain people seem to thrive in sin and other people who are righteous die early, like Billy Joel says, only the good die young. Or what do you do with this tree that's not bearing any fruit and this woman who's loosed? I see them as all fairly well connected, and I think that's why the scriptures are in the way they are. The first one was about these two events. One was caused just by a natural disaster, and the other one was caused by a, a human actually doing something evil. It says, they were present at that season, some who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. It's interesting because we don't have a historical record on exactly this, but previous to Jesus's ministry at this point, Pilate had actually uh, killed a bunch of Galileans. They had come and they wanted to connect the pool of uh, the pools of Solomon with Jerusalem and they wanted to make an aqueduct. And so they went to the temple and they said, listen, we, we need some money from you so we can complete this project. And the, the people at the temple, the priests and all, they actually gave a chunk of money to Pilate to build this thing. And then they thought about it later and they said, you know, we really shouldn't have done that. This was money that was dedicated to God and his service and his ministry. And we ended up funding this, this project. And so they sent the delegation of people back to Pilate to try to get the money back. And Pilate said, yeah, 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 sure. I'll, I'll see you in a little while in my office. And he had a bunch of officers dressed in plain clothes with daggers. And when he gave the, the signal, they all came out and they killed these people. And regardless, they didn't get their money back. But so there's an event that happened there and they're talking about it. You know, this time when they took these Galileans and they actually slaughtered them as they were going up to worship, as they were heading to uh, the temple. And so they were slaughtered. And Jesus answered and said to them, do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. We have we have things that happen. There are people who will storm into churches with guns and kill people. We have all sorts of crazy things that happen in this world, right? You ever try to make sense of it? How, if there's a loving God in heaven, does he allow evil to prevail? Or why does he allow bad things to happen to good people? Any of you ever struggle with that question? I have. Like, why is it that the evil people, the people who have all the money, they get all the breaks and they live long and then there are people who die early and they're innocent? And you, you scratch your head about that. How would God let innocent people suffer and guilty people thrive? Any of you have a problem with that? All right, get out. No, I'm just kidding. You get the picture. These guys are talking about this event that occurred. And... There, and of course, we try to assign blame, always, because we think that we are, you know, God's policemen and we're here to do that. We try to assign blame and figure out why it is. And so here, Pilate slaughters a bunch of Jews and nothing that they had done other than trying to ask for money back that they mistakenly gave. Don't give money if you're not really ready to give money and it might be better for you to pray through these things. It's the lesson I learned from it. But... Do you think that these folks were any more guilty than anyone else? Do you think that they were more worthy of that death than anyone else? Do you think that they were innocent? And I think Jesus' point is no one's innocent. There's no one innocent. There's no one that's any more worthy of a certain death than another. We're all guilty before God. The fact that he saves any of us is a miracle. And so Jesus kind of changes their question around. As though, do you think that there are certain innocent people who have deserved by their behavior a certain death or a certain length of life? We all kind of think that way in the back of our head. I don't know if it was the Santa Claus song, you know, he knows if you've been sleeping, he knows when you're awake, you better be good for goodness sake. I don't know if it's that whole mentality that's been built into us, but we kind of think that way. And he says, no, 
Do you think that they were any worse off? He says, no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. In other words, repentance is something you better get on right away. You might do it today because you don't know when you're going to die. Right? This could be the last service that you ever see me at. I could drop dead. You could drop dead. So I'm ready to go home. How about you? Although I got this nice sweater, I want to enjoy it for another day. <laughs> he talks about a tower that falls and a bunch of people who were killed. Or those 18 on whom the tower of Siloam fell, then they were killed. Do you think that they were worse sinners than all other men who dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Perish. We live close enough to the Twin Towers that we all knew somebody that was in there, if not more than one. And we were all touched by that. I lived right by the train station in Matawan. I remember how many cars stayed there for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. Do you think there were any worse sinners in the towers than anyone else? And yet Jesus says, no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. We're all going to die in some way, shape, or form, and there is no rhyme or reason as to how or when. And so the question is, are you ready? And Jesus boils it down to, instead of trying to figure out what God is doing or whether there are people worthy or unworthy of a certain life or a life's end, why don't you get ready? Be ready. Because you never know when there's going to be a tower to fall on you. You just never know. These things happen. And none of us is guaranteed a happy life or a long life. Unless we're in Christ, of course. And suddenly, we have internet issues. So since death could come at any moment, we should be ready. Verse 6. And he spoke this parable of a certain man who planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. And he said to the keeper of the vineyard, Look, for three years I've come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and I find none. By the way, do any of you know how long Jesus ministered? It's three years. Three years I've come seeking fruit on this fig tree and found none. Cut it down. Why else does it use up the ground? But he answered and said to him, Sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and fertilize it. And if it bears fruit, well, but if not, then you can cut it down. You know, Israel was always likened, especially in the Old Testament, to a fig tree. And he's speaking a parable to Israel. And he's saying, listen, I'm here to see if there's fruit. You know, if you've got a fruit tree, you have a fruit tree for a reason. It's because you want fruit. You don't just plant the tree because you feel like it. You, you, you have a fruit tree because you want fruit from it. And a fig, a fig tree is rather interesting. It, it gives, uh, I don't know if you, any of you have a fig tree. Fig trees are really interesting. You have to be careful because uh, the, the weather will kill them. But when they start popping, it's like tomatoes here in New Jersey. You know, you just have enough, you have more than enough for yourself and all your neighbors and anybody that would take them. And you end up trying to just, you know, send them on their way. But they, they grow and they're so prolific. Um, and coming year after year and trying to find fruit on a tree and not finding fruit on a tree, you wonder, did I get one of those, you know, trees that was fixed, you know, where it's not going to bear fruit? And it's, you start to wonder, they have fruitless trees. We had a fruitless pear tree in our front yard, which it was called a pear tree, but there was never any pears on it. And they do that on purpose so that you don't have the fruit that grows off the tree that becomes such an issue to clean up. And that's just built for foliage. But fruit is something that actually adds to the person that owns it, which is pretty cool. And he says, well, listen, I've come here for three years. Cut it down. It's just taken up space. And it's an amazing thing to think that God is somebody who comes and looks for fruit. And at some point he says, enough. I found no fruit. I keep coming to find fruit, and I don't find fruit. You wonder if he comes and he does that with people's lives. He says, look, I'm, I'm looking for change. I'm looking for you to have grown some fruit, and, and there is none. So why is it taking up the ground? Cut it down. 
You see, he's saying this all in conjunction together with the last prophecy, which is about the tower falling and, you know, Pilate mingling blood with sacrifices. And about you need to repent or you will perish. And here's another thing about, you know, here's a tree that uh, it, its days are numbered because it's not bearing fruit. And he says, well, let me dig around it, the gardener, the one who's taking care of the vineyard. Just let me dig around it and let me fertilize it and see if we can bring this thing up. But if not, then we can cut it down. And I just think about the patience of God in our lives where he looks for us to bear fruit. He looks for our nation to bear fruit. And it wasn't long after that, 70 AD, that Rome invaded Jerusalem and decimated the temple and it came down to the ground because there was no fruit, because they didn't recognize the coming of Jesus Christ. So there was no more need for sacrifice because Jesus had made one sacrifice for all. And so it was done. God is looking for fruit, guys. He's looking for change. He's looking for us to bear fruit. And fruit, if you're not familiar, is in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. The fruit of the Spirit, which is that which God works in our lives, is love. That's the first thing. Joy, peace, long-suffering, or you might know it as patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and the last, the hardest one, self-control. And against such things, there is no law. This is not something that will be acquired by you really deciding, by golly, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do good, I'm going to pull up my bootstraps, and I'm going to be better this year. No, the fruit of the Spirit is something when you die to yourself and you give up and you say, God, I need your help. And that's the only way that it happens is through the Spirit of God working in our lives. How many of you have been on a diet? Let me see all the overweight people. That's, okay, there we go. Diets don't work. Not unless you're ready to do it for the rest of your life. And it's really not a diet. It's called self-control. So... Three things, or four things I've learned from this. Uselessness invites disaster. The tree that bore no fruit was inviting disaster. It was basically taunting its owner. Hey, look, <laughs> I'm not producing any fruit for you. You're asking for disaster. Number two, if something only takes, it cannot survive. If something only takes, it cannot survive. If you have a tree that's just taking up space, taking up nutrients and taking up room, and it doesn't do anything about giving back or providing for the person who owns it, it's, in, it's definitely, you're in deep trouble. It can't survive. God gives second chances. Amen? Amen. And third chances and fourth chances and fifth chances. But he comes at this time and says, you know, cut this thing down. No, no, no. Let, give me a minute. You know, so let me let me dig up around it. Let me fertilize it. So if you feel like you're under a lot of manure, it might be that the Lord is fertilizing you. And he's trying to develop some fruit in your life. It's when you think your life stinks. There might be a reason. And number four, there is a final chance. There is a final chance when the Lord will give us that grace to change again. And as we have a new year that's coming on, we have a chance to be able to do that and to bear fruit for God. So I think it's a, a good opportunity. And we come to this place where this woman comes to church. She comes to temple on the Sabbath. Verse 10. And now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And behold... There was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bent over and could in no way raise herself up. Now, you've seen folks like this, right? It's one of those things that affects the, the body. And when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said to her, Woman, you are loosed from your infirmity. And he laid his hands on her and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. Now, you guys know that every time that Jesus is at the place of worship, 
and there's collected people. You know, they have people always looking to see what Jesus is going to do and ready to criticize him. And then there are other people that actually come to meet with Jesus because they have some infirmity. <laughs> Notice it wasn't a physical infirmity, it was a spiritual infirmity. I find that interesting. Makes me go, hmm. A spiritual infirmity. She comes on the Sabbath and Jesus is there and she's coming to meet with Jesus. There are other people just coming to judge. I can tell you I've been both those people. <laughs> there have been times I've come to church and, and I come to church and say, yeah, I wouldn't have put it that way, Pastor. I would have done it. Some, and why didn't you add this other scripture? You really should. That, that would have made your point much better. And what are you wearing? What is that sweater? <laughs> what are you trying to say? And you can do that. You can put your place in, into a judgmental mentality, or you can come to meet with Jesus. You can come and get your hands laid on you and have change and bear fruit and be loosed and be free like this woman was. So you have these kind of two categories, and then you have the crowd that kind of always sees and comments on everything. But Jesus sees her, and he's instantly motivated to action. Not criticism, not anything else, action. You know, when we see things, we should be criticized. We, we shouldn't be just critics. We should be moved to action. And so she's freed. Notice Jesus does it by laying his hands on her. You know, he doesn't lay hands on everyone, but he did lay hands on her. In fact, anybody who's demon-possessed, you never see Jesus laying hands on. It's a curious little fact. But he, you do when there's infirmities like this. He lays his hands on them. And she's completely and totally healed. And she's loosed from her infirmity. Have you got one of those you'd like to be loosed from today? I, I, I have a back. I know I'm going to have difficulty in the, the years to come because at the end of a sermon, I'm like, I, I got to go sit down. An infirmity. It could be a spiritual issue. It could be something that Jesus can touch. I don't know about you, but I, I, want, I want the next year to be different than this year Amen. in a lot of ways. Amen. And so she comes to Jesus and Jesus frees her and he says, you're free from your infirmity and she's able to stand up completely. And praise God, she's been loosed. But, this is when the music gets boom, boom, boom. But the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. And of course, healing on the Sabbath, by the way, is never prohibited anywhere in the scriptures. But the Jews had all of these extraneous laws of describing, like when God made laws, he made this many laws. And then when the rabbis described what it meant, they made big thick books describing what it is that God meant because he couldn't quite put the details out there you know, like divorce. You could get divorced if your wife, you know, burned your toast. That's not anywhere in the scriptures. That's in the Mishnah. It's a different, different deal. But anyway, <coughs> he's indignant. He's angry because Jesus heals on the Sabbath, which apparently has more value to him not healing on the Sabbath than healing on the Sabbath, which you got to wonder what in the world is that about? And he said to the crowd. I find it amazing. This guy didn't address Jesus personally. <laughs> he talked to the crowd. You, you don't find these little bitty speed bumps an issue. It's like somebody coming up here and interrupting me and standing here and doing something, and I'm going to berate all of you as he stands here. Do you, you get that? That's whacked. And he said to the crowd, there are six days on which men ought to work. Therefore, come and be healed on them and not on the Sabbath day. Do you realize how messed up that is? Listen, this is the Sabbath. You're supposed to be coming here for rest. There are six days that you should work. By the way, how many days? Six. How many of you have a six day work week? Me too. I, I work harder this day than all other days. But anyway, six days. 
in which men ought to work. So think about this. If you have an infirmity, you want to be healed, you got to take a day off of work on the six days that you're supposed to be working for you to go get healed. So if you're not breaking one thing, you're breaking another. So come here on one of your work days and get healed. Does that make any sense? Anyway, number one, he's addressing the crowd. He doesn't have a problem with the crowd. He's got a problem with what Jesus just did. There are six days on which men ought to work. Yeah, I agree. And that's why I was working all week. Therefore, come and be healed on them. Well, then I wouldn't be working on six days. And not the Sabbath day. And the Lord answered him and said, hypocrite. <laughs> that's why he called him a hypocrite. So taking one of the six off is okay. And you can break that commandment to come here to be healed. But by the way, the rule of the synagogue wouldn't be able to heal anybody at any point in time. Only Jesus can. Amen. And so they came when Jesus was there. It just, I read through this and I just stumble over all of the, all of the inconsistencies. And Jesus then addresses him, not the crowd, and says, hypocrite, do not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or donkey from a stall and lead it to water it? Notice he said loose. It's the same thing he told this woman, be loosed. And what he says, if you have an ox or a donkey, wouldn't you loose them from their moorings so that they could go and get a drink of water? I mean, at least you would do that. Even on the Sabbath, when you're supposed to be resting completely, wouldn't you make sure your animal was cared for? Of course you would. And that's the implied answer. Of course you would. And lead it away to water it. So ought not this woman being a daughter of Abraham, who Satan is bound, think of it, for 18 years, be loosed from the bond on the Sabbath? And when he said these things, all of his adversaries were put to shame, and all of the multitude rejoiced for all the glorious things which were done. This guy had absolutely no compassion on this woman at all. He was concerned about the rule of law. No compassion whatsoever. I have to be careful. I could be on my way to church and see somebody with a, you know, who's broken down on the side of the road and they obviously need help. I could easily say, well, I got to go to church. There's people waiting on me. I got to get going. You know, sometimes in the midst of your very well-organized and well-scheduled lives, things will happen and you'll be tested to see if compassion is more important than some rule keeping. I mean, some of us don't keep any rules at all, so we don't care. But you will be tested on whether a human being is more important than some duty. And I think Jesus definitely did the right thing. And he thought about people. He didn't say you should take time off of work on the six days that you're supposed to work, because you know that's part of the commandment for the Sabbath. On six days you shall work. That's what the scripture says. But not on the seventh. On the seventh is the Sabbath of the Lord. And on that, you don't do any work. And it's interesting that this guy wouldn't face off with Jesus directly. He talks to the crowd. Like they're at fault for coming on the Sabbath. No, they were in the place they should have been. And Jesus was doing the thing he should have been doing. And she's loosed. Praise God. You know, Jesus still looses people today. I'm glad to see that. And he talks about what a qualified patient this is. He says, what about this woman? By the way, she's a woman and not a man. And Jesus says that there's a preferential thing that you should show towards a woman than a man. <gasps> That's a sexist statement. Listen, when I greet a woman and I greet a man, I don't greet them the same way. I don't go up to any woman, hey, how you doing? <laughs> give you my knuckles. Yeah, you give me some knuckles. Come on. I don't greet a woman that way. You know, give a guy a good handshake. John Colbeth's got a good handshake. Got a couple other guys, got a good handshake. I never shake a woman's hand like that. 
But men, yeah, yeah, you know, you hit each other and you know, I'd never do that with a woman. He says, shouldn't this woman, number one, she gets preferential treatment because, by the way, I opened the door for my wife, not because she's an invalid. That's an expression of showing her I love her. Again, I opened doors for restaurants and all other things and put my hand in the small of her back and guide her in, not because she doesn't know how to walk, but because I love my wife. And it's just another way that I can show her that I care for her above all others, because I made a promise. So I gotta, I, I'm a rule keeper, so I got to do that. But she's a qualified patient, number one, because she's a woman. Number two, because she's a daughter of Abraham. She's Jewish. She's a recipient of all the promises that were given. She understands the revelation of God's word that's been brought. She should be healed instead of neglected and forgotten about and just swept under the rug because of some rule that some guy wants to enforce. And because... Satan has bound her. Shouldn't somebody who's a woman, who's a child of Abraham, a daughter of Abraham, and Satan has bound? And then he says, think about it. I, I love that little think about it. Think about it. 18 years. This woman could not look up at the stars for 18 years. Don't you think she should have been free? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm questioning, what about your neighbors? What about your friends? What about those people that you know that you care about that are bound in sin? They can't see straight, can't stand up straight because they have an infirmity. Don't they deserve to be loosed? Might be that Jesus wants to use you as his hands. And so when this happens, everybody was thrilled and his ad adversaries were put aside this beautiful gift that Jesus brings on the Sabbath to this woman is a, a treasured thing. Coming into the new year, we have choices as to what we're going to do with our life. I think the scripture says, instead of, instead of looking and trying to judge why everything happens the way it does, why not be ready for whatever happens? Like Jesus said. And I need to look at the branches of my life and figure out where in my life do I lack? Where in my life is it that I should be doing more, bearing more fruit for God? Because I don't want to turn around and regret something I didn't do. I'd rather be busy, and even if it makes me sweat and it's hard, I'd rather be bearing fruit for the Lord than look back with regret. And is there an infirmity that I might have, where I need Jesus' touch in my life. So for me to be able to walk on and do those things and stand up straight and do what Jesus asked me to do, maybe I need a touch. I hope that the Lord uses this in your life today. The Word of God is always so very significant. I pray that the Lord would help us to understand his word. As I ask the worship team to come up, I'd like you to pray with me as they make their way up. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your love and for your grace in our lives. I pray that you help us. You help us to do those things that would give you praise and honor, that we would bear fruit unto repentance. Lord, you know our lives, you know every aspect of our heart. You know those things that we need. And especially coming into a new year, I pray that you might equip, sensitize our hearts. Lord, as we analyze the branches of our lives as to whether we're bearing fruit for you. And if there's anything else, Lord, that we can do, I pray that you might alert us to it, sensitize our hearts. I thank you, Lord, that you do continue to heal and to place your hands upon us and change us. I pray that you might do that for each one of us, Lord, in the areas in which you know that we might yield to you in this place and even right now. Lord, take our lives and help us to live for you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.